All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's latest Fortra webinar, ACS for Administrators. This is going to be your opportunity to explore some of the features in Access Client Solutions beyond just 5250, where most of us spend most of our time. My name is Chuck Lisinski. I'm the Director of Technical Solutions here for the robot product line at Fortra, longtime IBM I uh, user, administrator, trainer, etc. And I'm joined today by my friend Alex Lazaro. Hello, Alex. Talk to us about yourself a little bit. Hello, Chuck, and thanks for that. I'm Alex from Argentina. I'm a senior consultant for professional services on Fortra, and uh, I have been around for quite some time also. Uh, I have been as a sysadmin since 2005, maybe, and I, I fell in love with the platform, and I'm working here at Fortra, uh, trying to help our customers. Excellent. And, and Alex, you've actually done a common presentation as well, haven't you? Oh, yes, I did. Yeah, uh, I did. Uh, I was lucky enough to be joined by uh, Randy Watson, and, and we did a presentation on performance last year. And um, we, it's also available on the Fortra website because we did it uh, on a webinar. So it, it was nice. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Awesome. Good work. All right. So today's presentation is going to be recorded, is being recorded as we speak. You'll receive a link to the recording. You'll receive some additional collateral, and so you don't have to worry about taking notes furiously while Alex and I talk about ACS. So this is what our agenda looks like. We're going to start with the basics. We're going to talk about what ACS is and how to get it and so forth. We're going to spend a little time with some of the features of the technology that you probably haven't explored, such as analyzing SQL performance. You probably have maybe touched on a little bit IFS and spool file management and file transfers, but Alex is going to talk to us a little bit more about that. Then we're going to shift gears a little bit. We're going to talk about running SQL scripts, data from your system to provide you information about system health and so forth and how you can automate some of that. Alex is then going to take us through open source package management and restricted state automation. All right, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Alex to talk to us about some of the basics. Alex. Okay, thanks, Jack. And really, this is the basics. How do you get uh, ACS? What What is I ACS, basically? How do you get it and uh, from where? So ACS is the Access Client Solutions. That's the That has been the strategic uh, method for interacting with the IBM I since 2019, it replaced client access and not only client access, but also iSeries Navigator, which was an excellent tool that was really used by everyone. Now you have ACS, which which runs on Java, and basically that means that runs on uh, every operating system, and it's also integrated with IBM, IBM Navigator for i, which runs on a web server. So you have everything that you had before but on a more um, on a platform that can run on uh, any operating system. So how basically how do you get it? You get it from the uh, ESS from the IBM ESS side. Uh, you can actually also get it from the ACS side. They are two different sites. It's a free tool. You need an IBM ID and uh, Basically, it's better to download it use, using HTTP. You, you have uh, the, the option to download it using the download director, but you need to install stuff on your system, and it's really not the best tool that IBM ever developed. So you have the base uh, package at the top, and uh, in the middle, you can see the application package. Uh, in this case, it's in English. And the application package uh, has the ODBC connector, which is uh, really important if you're going to be accessing data from your uh, Windows. There's also an application package for uh, Linux as well. So <clears throat> you have several versions. Once you uh, download it, you have um, 
a zip file on the yeah on the next slide you have a zip file there you can see um, that uh, it's the previous to the last version because we have uh, the latest version that was launched a couple of weeks ago but this is like previous to the last so once you open the, this uh, file and you extract it you can uh, you can run the one of those installers any of them and it's recommended that you install the uh, 64 bit installer because that works uh, a bit better on on the memory management and it performs a bit better so once you um, double click there you get asked all of the questions of the tools that you will be using if you want to run the, the emulation, which is basically what everybody does, but also if you want to run SQL scripts, if you want to access the RFS, if you want to use the navigator for ISO, so you, you will be asked a lot of questions. You just click on yes on the tools that you will be using, and basically that's it. Uh, you get the system installed. But then you have the opportunity, and especially if you will be distributing this installation to uh, another users you will you have to open the, the the application and run it as an administrator and this uh, tab restrictions shows up under your preferences and this basically allows you to select the functions that will be available to the users so um, if you uh, select um, whatever functions that your users will be using and then you export the uh, registry file, you get a way to um, have the same installation on all of your uh, PCs, on all of the PCs of your users. For instance, here I created a limited restricted version I exported the registry file. You can see that it's on, on the desktop of, of that Windows. It's a, a registry, a normal Windows registry file that has some registry keys. So once you double click on it, that information is incorporated into your Windows and your installation runs, as you can see uh, on the screen, it's uh, a, a limited installation. It doesn't have, for instance, the run SQL, uh, scripts it does it doesn't have the a the IFS um, in the the tool to interact with the IFS so you can see that basically you get a chance to um, to restrict the use for you for your users so this is really cool a really cool way to do it mm. then another thing that's really important and I uh, believe it or not uh, to this day we have uh, people using the uh, the telnet without securing it so uh, it's really important that that you get to secure your telnet you need for in order to do that you need to create a certificate on your DCM and you need to that yeah that's basically the interface on on the navigator for right for DCM and you need to assign the certificate to the telnet server and then once you do that you're able yeah you're able to uh, select the Telnet uh, TLS SSL as a connection protocol and then the destination port as 992 and you will be getting that nice uh, lock on the bottom right corner of your screen that indicates that the communication is encrypted so the bad guys will not be able to to read your your information so if you want to learn more about how to set up ACS and how to deploy it securely, I highly recommend you that you uh, you see the, the webinars by Amy Williams and Steve Sisk. They are both uh, security consultants here at Fortra and they did a great job with those webinars, didn't they, Jack? Yeah, they really did, and uh, I mean, I've watched them several times, and they're they're also going to be doing some common presentations at the uh, common conference about uh, securing ACS and so forth. So, uh, hats off to them for uh, helping us live in a secure world. Hmm. So, Alex, so you you 
showed us how to restrict access to certain features. Mm -hmm. Let's look at the complete suite of what is incorporated into ACS. It's not just 5250, even though it seems like we kind of live in that. So, you know, we're going to do we're going to do some discussions today about file transfer at IFS. There's a navigator link here to get directly into Navigator for I. You can get into a PuTTY session. You can even work with your schemas or libraries and databases and set up things like journaling here uh, in ACS. We're also going to look at the uh, run SQL scripts option. Of course, it's going to be a JDBC connection because it's going to be coming in from your PC or Mac, right? Um, we're also going to be looking at SQL performance analysis because there's an SQL performance center and that's this is an area that we're spending a lot of time more and more time in uh, uh, as applications are developed using more and more SQL features um, and IBM is putting a lot of emphasis on this as well so that's an area that's definitely worth spending some time in so just for instance if you're more of a database manager and and uh, you want to take a look and work with and and uh, optimize your your database. There's the schemas option, where you can look at things like locks. You can look at things like permissions. You can look at statistics. You can look at things like the index advisor uh, over your database. So this is the kind of thing that, for instance, if you did have more of a database background or if uh, as an IBMI developer, you're more so involved in, in um, optimizing the database. Guess what? There's an option for that in ACS. Likewise, here's a little tip for you. Uh, changing passwords across multiple systems that are configured within ACS. All right, so here we are. We've got uh, multiple systems that we've configured inside of our connection properties here in ACS. And uh, under preferences, there's a uh, an option for passwords where you can select multiple systems and say change passwords. And guess what? Uh, with one entry, you'll be changing your password across multiple systems. Um, a feature that's pretty cool in the product, and I can see some use for this, is called screen history. So every screen you go to, every 5250 screen you go to, this, the emulator will create basically a screen capture. And so, for instance, a classic example of using this, and Alex is actually going to show us this live here in a few minutes, but a classic example of this might be, for instance, you're working with um, uh, memory pools, and you might be shifting between uh, work system status and work active job and work share pool, and you want to kind of compare information together. So you can go to those screens and capture that information, and then you can reference those screens uh, easily just by double-clicking on any of those images. And you can turn that feature on and off. You don't have to have it on all the time. And you can even create a history file um, that you can reference later on. Okay, so we've dabbled a little bit here. Uh, let's let's dig into some of the meat of ACS and this whole thing about analyzing your SQL performance. Step back a little bit. What exactly are we analyzing? So when an SQL payload is submitted to the operating system, whether it's internal or maybe coming in via an ODBC request, um, that SQL statement comes into the operating system, and of course the first thing, we check the syntax, or the operating system checks the syntax, and thank goodness it does, because I'm usually messing up the syntax left and right. But regardless, it checks the syntax, and then it goes about creating and optimizing how it's going to submit that and work with all the database features in order to retrieve the data and present it to the end user or the, uh, the job that has the SQL payload. So what are the things that it looks like to optimize, or it looks at to optimize the request? It looks at all your work management um, features. It looks at views and indexes, okay? So if you're using DDS or DDL and, and what indexes are available or does it need to create temporary indexes? Do you have SMP turned on? It looks at things like, even like at your IBM uh, release and mod level, table size, number of rows, 
job attributes course. It looks at all that. So it looks at all this information and it creates what's called a plan. And that plan goes into a cache. All right, so it's basically keeping track of all the SQL statements that either have occurred or are occurring. And it, it creates this uh, list of how to access the data based on the SQL statement that was presented. And finally, after the uh, plan has been generated, that's submitted to the operating system, it opens the file, it executes the SQL statement and provides output. Right? And all that happens behind the scenes, you never have to even think about it. And that's, again, well, you know, one of the beauties of the integrated database and how SQL has been implemented in our operating system. So when was this plan cache actually developed and when did it happen? It was back in 5.4, it's fully automatic, but we're given this interface in ACS and in Navigator to look at the plan cache and literally to run some queries over the plan cache. That data in the plan cache, of course, is constantly changing based on, for instance, the number of occurrences of a, of a particular uh, SQL request or new SQL requests or old SQL requests. And, and the plan cache is continually pruned as well. Some of the old data drops off. Um, there's no start or stop button either. I mean, it just, it just happens. But the, what's important to know is that the plan cache is cleared at IPL or you can clear it using uh, a stored procedure. And that, okay, that's so, something, sorry, yeah. Chuck, that's Go something that's, that's really important because uh, uh, not, not long ago, there, I had some customers when I was uh, a system administrator that did an mm -hmm. IPL on a weekly basis. Uh, I don't know why. Yeah. Okay. That's, and, a, good, and that, that's a good that, point. Yeah. That ended up uh, hindering the, the the work of this plan cache. Plan cache. So that's that's uh, something that people need to know. Sure. Sure. And you know, it is much more common nowadays to maybe only IPL once a quarter or even oh, yeah. once a year. Yeah. Right. Yep. All right. So how do we get to the SQL Performance Center at the startup? splash screen of, of ACS, you'll see a SQL Performance Center option, or if you're in a 5250 session, if you go under Actions, you will see the SQL Performance Center there. And so what will that show you? So the first thing it's going to show you, and we'll do this live too, but just to first expose you to it, um, there'll be an, um, a summary of the plan cache. All right, for instance, when was the plan cache uh, created? Uh, how many queries have run? How many SQL statements have been submitted? How big is the plan cache? You can see here the current number of plans in the cache are uh, about 3,000. This was from back in uh, January. And then at any point in time, you can create what's called a plan cache snapshot. So it's basically a dump of the data and then you can query that data. And you can query the data using the built-in queries, the built-in query features that are available uh, in the product. Or you, can, you could literally write your own queries and query the data because the data is actually going to go into a physical file uh, in a library. Uh, this happens to be an example of doing a plan cache dump, kind of a limited plan cache dump, all right, where we specified we really only want to see the top 25 um, statements, most frequently run statements. So your dump of the plan cache doesn't have to be a complete dump. You could have more of a limited view of the data. And then you can also use a, uh, uh, a statement, an SQL statement running. You could run this in uh, run SQL scripts, or you could run it on a native uh, SQL statement. And uh, basically, using a stored procedure, generate that. So this could actually you could actually run a, a statement on a regular basis to dump the plan cache. And when the plan cache is then available, you'll see your plan cache listed here. You might have multiple. And then with a simple right-click option, you've got the ability to analyze. And it's here where you'll get the uh, built-in plan cache queries that you can run and um, you know, provide you with the visibility that you need. All right. Now, there's another feature that's kind of interesting that you can experiment with called the Visual Explain. And basically, it's a 
graphical representation of this plan. You know, what is the plan that came up with from the operating system, from the optimizer, to execute your SQL statement? All right, so you could select any statement. This happens to be the summary view showing me uh, you know, my, my top queries on the system. And with a right-click visual explain, you'll actually see a graphical representation of the statement being submitted to the operating system and the steps that it's going to go through to provide data to the end user or to the job that submitted the request. All right, let's go through a little bit of a live demonstration. All right, so I've got my 5250 session, and I've got my initial startup screen for ACS, and you'll see the SQL Performance Center here, and you'll also see the SQL Performance Center here. So initially what you're going to get, and I'm working with a system called Wisdom, all right, you can see that back here in the 5250, and also here on the plan cache, and you could select other systems to uh, experiment with. And then uh, initially what you're going to see is a summary of the data. All right, so uh, you can see that this system was actually IPL'd uh, on this date and uh, looks like we've got 875 active queries. Um, we're, we've had 734,000 queries since the start of the plan cache, but of those we've got 2,897 in the plan cache, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is your, your summary information. Now the actual snapshots that we've done so far looks like this, all right? So we've got these four snapshots um, that we've dumped. Basically it's a dump of the plan cache uh, data, all right? And uh, let's bring up my run SQL scripts, and I'm going to do a dump for you right now. And let's use this one. All right, so uh, this would be the statement to execute the uh, plan cache dump. I'm going to rename the plan cache dump name, and it's going to go to this library on IBM I. All right, so we'll do a run all, and it only takes literally uh, just a few seconds. You can see the statement ran successfully. All right, so if I show you what this looks like now on IBM I, see we now have one, a brand new plan cache dump. And if we look at the data, you can see it literally is a physical file that you could query. So you could query this yourself. All right, however, I'll do a refresh. All right, so there's our plan cache snapshot number three that we just generated. I have the analyze option. And basically what the analyze option is is a pre-configured list of queries that you can run over the data. All right, so here's the summary. And so for instance, if I want to look at the SQL statement summary or just a total list of the SQL statements, I could do that. I can also look at different categories of queries. All right, so like what types of SQL statements were executed or requested. All right, most people take a look at the SQL statement summary. And what this is going to do is it's going to take a look at the specific SQL statement, the number of occurrences, where it occurred from, how long did it take to run, and so forth. And so it basically gives you a table of all the SQL statements that were run. All right, you can um, sort this however you like. For instance, total runtime, maximum open time, average runtime, maximum runtime. You can see that's how we're how we're sorted right now. And um, uh, I actually asked this view to put the IP address for um, the, an external um, ODBC type request. So if this SQL is coming in from the outside, I'll see the IP address. And likewise, 
if I scroll over here to the right, we won't look at all the data, but I want to show you that it will tell you the job name information. All right, so the user, uh, job number, current user, and so forth. All right, so if that's important to you, there is a view option where under columns you can select which columns you want to see or not. All right, you can uncheck the ones you don't want to see. And so, for instance, if I want to grab the uh, job name and the job user, job number, maybe current user, and I want to move that up, all right, I can move that up to the top of my view. All right, and I probably, I don't think I'll take the time to move it up all the way, but I'll say OK here, and then, of course, those columns are now closer to the front, and I could have brought them all the way up to the top as well. All right, so that's the statement summary, and, and uh, uh, you know, there is the, you know, the visual explain option too, all right, where we could look at, at that information as well. All right, the only thing I didn't show you here is that in the uh, original SQL Performance Center, instead of doing the plan cache dump via the stored procedure, you could execute a plan cache dump directly here in the uh, in the interface. All right, so that is just a little introduction to the SQL Performance Center. Let's take a look at IFS spool files and file transfer, Alex. Okay, thank you. So, um, like we said, this is not only the 5250, so uh, if you're going to manage your IFS, you don't need to do a work link. You have this wonderful tool that you can open on your ACS, and you get to create uh, directories, you can create libraries, folders, you can upload uh, stuff, you can download stuff, you can uh, delete, rename, I mean, all the things that you can do on a work link and more. And you can also change the permissions, and you can see the properties of the file. So this is a really great tool that it's useful for uh, several things. I mean, and it, keep, it gives you a view, sorry, it gives you a view of your IFS, uh, something that, that you can complement with uh, robot space in case you want to do some cleaning because you get to see that you have lots of stuff and maybe stuff that you don't need anymore. Robot space can help you there. So um, besides this, you can also go to the next slide and you can go to uh, work with the spool files and work with the spool files it gets you uh, all the spool files uh, by default for uh, the current user I can change that to be instead of the current using the yeah using sorry the filters I can change that to be uh, the, uh, my user for instance Alex and if I click to uh, and if I click OK, it will bring me to the next slide, which is basically all the spool files by by Alex. So this set of filters are really really uh, useful. Uh, I, 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 my wife is a system operator, and she finds it really useful because sometimes she needs to get to get the the, the job logs really quick and. On the filters, you just enter the job name, the username, the the job number, and you get the, the spool file in really really quick. So um, and then the the other thing you have on the on the ACS is this tool that it you had it in the past, but you have some options that are a bit better now. You can actually upload the file from the uh, from your PC and you can create a physical file based on a PC file you get to download or upload a uh, data files and you can actually automatically run the the file transfers I mean you don't need to interact at all if you click there on the option to run the transfer request automatically it will run and you can even uh, scale it on the on the Windows Task uh, Scaler. So that that's a really cool thing. So okay, I'm going to the demo now. So uh, let me share my screen. 
So and, and and I'm thinking I'm I'm going to start with with, with this that we already see. Uh, did, this was the the screen history that uh, we discussed with Chuck earlier. So uh, he mentioned one of the uses that that could be uh, like um, uh, you're working with. Uh, data that's on one screen and you can compare it with another screen but uh, there, there are lots of usage for instance if you are working on a task that you need to take screenshots and it happens every time that someone's doing a change installing software installing pts doing an upgrade you actually here you have the screenshots and and you can just uh copy them and paste them on whatever document you have. So this is actually a cool little nice feature. Um, then uh, here we access the, using this one, actually this button on or uh, on options um, integrated file system, we get to access the, the, the tool we discussed earlier, the um, uh, file system uh, tool. So here, basically, you can work with uh, um, your IFS. You can upload, download file. For instance, here I can uh, go and upload a file. I'm going to upload a PDF that we, uh, for instance, that I have here. So, and this this is really cool. You you don't have to FTP. You just go and click there and it's starting the upload and it will upload a bit slowly because this is a big file but there you see it's starting so while i i'm uploading this i can go and take a look at the printer output the printer up output you access it via actions printer output so if you are going to see the printer output you can go and see the filters and I was uh, showing the, I'm actually showing the, the, all the spool files for my user ID, but if I change it instead of all of the spool files, I want to see the ones for the last day. The, yeah, the last day I click, oh, sorry. <laughs> I have a connection issue. I click on uh, filter, and uh, I click on last day. Let me see if it works now. Okay, and that, there it's bringing me the the spool files that I have for the last day. So that's a way to to limit the files that I'm I'm seeing. And the the thing that I discussed before, if you want to bring up only the the job log for a single uh, job. You just need to fill this information for the job, and it will bring you all the spool files that that job created. So this is a really cool, nice tool. And uh, then we were working with the file transfer. And it's really nice. You just need to create the file transfer and you can save it as a transfer file. And if you, if you create it with uh, run the transfer automatically, you just double click on it, it will a launch an, an ACS uh, instance. Uh, this will bring you the screen for the transfer. And uh, basically, the, as you can see, the transfer is in progress. So it's running. This is basically how you set up the transfer. And there, there it says that the transfer is complete. So I'm going to open the file. And uh, there's the file, and it's not liking something, but I'm not converting it. So basically, I just transferred a file from the IBM I into a Excel CSV file. And this was by just setting this up, saving it as a DTFX file, and, and of course, uh, using the um, on properties, going with the um, uh, run transfer request automatically. If I click this, I just can double click and it will transfer the file automatically. So this is uh, a really cool way and you can actually uh, scale these things. So it's a really good way to get your files every day, I don't know, before you, you, you even get to the office. 
Right. And right. Uh, I think that that was it. No. Yeah. My demos. Very good. Yeah, cool. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Let's, Thank uh, you. Let's jump into a new topic, and we're going to talk about uh, running SQL scripts to interrogate information about your system. So I want to step back a little bit, though. I want to say that as a IBM I administrator, operator, uh, anybody outside of the programming realm, so to speak, if you're interacting with the system, you really need to get a handle on your SQL skills. All right, there are various SQL uh, training classes out there. Common has an SQL boot camp that Scott Forsty put together. He did a great job because it's really become an integral part of the operating system now, even for administrators. And hey, that's why we're doing this presentation. All right. And um, so let's talk a little bit about how you can leverage SQL to interrogate the operating system. So we're going to talk about something called SQL services. What are they? How do you get them? What do you do with them? And so forth. How do you run them? All right. So first of all, um, you know, we've discussed this internally a little bit here at Fortra and, you know, we talked about uh, or discussed, you know, what are they and, and why are people using them? And I, I like the comment that we got one out of one of our, uh, one of my fellow employees was, um, that SQL services really make IBM I look normal, right? It's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a pretty, it's a, SQL is a, is a common language now between many databases, all right? So it's both a strategic and a common method for accessing system information. And basically what IBM has done is they've created tables that contain system information or stored procedures that allow data to be retrieved about the system, all right? So it's more than just accessing a database and querying um, information, for instance, in your CRM or in your manufacturing database. Now we're retrieving data about the operating system. One thing I will point out, and we've uh, discovered this, and IBM will tell you this, that some SQL services perform better than others because behind the scenes, maybe what they're doing is they're calling a stored procedure and they're accessing multiple tables and they're doing some compares. And so, you know, these where SQL can be unbelievably fast in how it retrieves data, some of these perform better than others. And likewise, as new TRs come out, new uh, technology releases, you will see new and better um, uh, SQL services. And there's different categories of IBM I services around application, BRMS, PowerHA, COM, IFS, Java, and so forth. So there's a lot of information out there on the IBM website about these that discuss how the um, SQL command is put together. All right, so here just from the most recent uh, TR releases for 7.5 and 7.4, here's some of the things that were enhanced. And we're not going to go into the details of this, but I'll just point out, for instance, you can even query the data in the security audit journal, mm -hmm. or you can generate a spreadsheet using an SQL statement. All right, uh, you could reply to an inquiry message in QSIS Hopper via an SQL service. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. So these these have have really come a long way. So oh, Alex, I'm send, sure you can you... send email. Yeah, I mean that yeah. that's really great. I mean, yeah, yeah, and so um, it, that's why I say it's really important for you as a system administrator or operator to to learn SQL. I just can't emphasize that enough. Okay, so uh, how do you find the various services? So one of the things you can do is you can go out to the IBM website and just search for IBM I services SQL, and you will get a um, plethora of information. The other thing you can do is in the run SQL scripts option, there is an examples option under edit, and you can look at and actually insert examples that are listed into the run SQL script dialog and run these SQL services right then and there. All right, so for instance here, we've inserted from example this particular ASP management uh, query looking at total capacity 
And um, one thing we may, you may end up doing with these is you might modify the query slightly. Like you might want to look at a particular ASP number here on this query. So you can customize these and you can save them as a PC file. Any SQL information uh, in the run SQL strips can be saved as a PC file. You can also create a category of examples. All right. So how can you run them? We showed you here in the run SQL scripts. You can also use native SQL. Okay. There is also a third option. Some of these SQL services you might want to run more often and collect data over a longer period of time and be able to look at that graphically and be able to print reports and historical information about that. So one of the tools in our robot product line is called Robot Monitor where we've got all kinds of built-in system and application metrics that, that we can collect for you over your IBM I power systems environment. Not just IBM I, but the other operating systems that um, run on power. So we'll, we collect various data points and we'll show you that in a graphical interface. And we can even send you notification if you have exceeded a threshold that you've assigned to one of the metrics, all right? One of the metrics that we can collect out of here um, is based on an SQL statement. If you give us an SQL statement, we will run that, and it can be an SQL statement uh, out of uh, the SQL services categories. And as long as that SQL statement returns a single value, an integer, a uh, decimal value, a percentage, or even a piece of text, We'll run that for you. We'll collect it over time. We'll display it in a dashboard or a, or a gauge uh, in a dashboard. We'll compare it to thresholds. We'll send you a notification. You can run reports over it, and all that happens automatically. The other thing you can do is you can wrap robot monitor monitoring around the SQL activity that's happening on your system. So I mentioned we've got pre-configured uh, data points that we can collect, CPU, job count, fault rates, disk I.O., run, job runtime, temporary storage, etc. And you can wrap these various metrics around, for instance, those infamous QZDA SO init jobs. And we can keep statistics on that. And we can tell you what time of day, what day of the week, what days of the month are your worst offenders. And we can even give you visibility into the SQL statement where you can drill down into the SQL statement from the robot monitor graphical interface. So just a couple examples of this user supplied SQL maybe embedded into robot monitor, Java heap size. All right, so you could run this yourself, run this command yourself on run SQL script, or you can embed it into robot monitor and we can collect that data for you. Or um, uh, this was a request from a customer, IP version 4 connection count. All right, here we're looking at the Netstat info table in QSYS2, collecting information for port 5000 and above for IP version 4. You could even embed a custom query that doesn't use IBM SQL services, but maybe does look at a particular table or file on the system. So here we're just getting a count from the robot history file for all jobs that terminated for today. And you could embed that into our product. We'll run the SQL, we'll collect the data, and we'll display the results for you, we'll collect it, we'll compare it to a threshold, and uh, you know, on and on and on it goes. All right? So basically we're talking about automation. All right, so let's take a quick look at, uh, actually we're not gonna look at Robot Monitor first, we're gonna look at uh, run SQL scripts all right, so here, here we have a blank slate, and I'm connecting to the system that we want to talk to, or my wisdom system. So under the edit option is examples, insert from examples. All right, and uh, here's the options that we have. We want to specifically look at IBM I services. All right, and you'll see various IBM I services that were created for communications for application, IFS, Java, journaling, messages, PTF information, a whole bunch on security and storage and work management and so forth. There is a search option. So for instance, if I want to look at just security 
or if I want to look at something related to users or something related to PTF, you don't necessarily have to know where everything exists. You can just type in something in the search and uh, find it that way. All right. So uh, just uh, just for example, let's go to IBM I Services, and I'm going to go to PTFs. And so here's a uh, an option to look up PTF gr uh, group currency with IBM. If you click on Insert, it inserts the SQL statement into the interface, and it's there. You can then do a run, all right, and run this. Now there is another option here, and that is to do a file save as. And oh, I'm sorry. Let's go back here. I wanted to do examples and then save as new example, all right? And what this allows you to do is you can create your own category of frequently used IBM I services. Okay, I created one called custom, and I can put any um, query that I use fairly often into that example or that custom category, which I'm gonna do, all right? File name must be specified. All right, current, uh, I'll call it PTF currency. Okay, so once I've got that saved, then when I do go back to Examples, insert from examples. Here's my custom examples, and here's all my frequently used IBM SQL services that I can then uh, access. Okay, one that I want to show you, and uh, let me clear this. I'm going to show you one called port exhaustion. All right, we had a request from a customer uh, who wanted to know how many connections, IP version 4 connections they had at port 5000 and above. And it turned out that there was an SQL uh, service for that. All right, and I'm going to run it on my current system, my wisdom system that says I've got 298 active connections right now. Okay, so what we did for them is we put that request into Robot Monitor. So Robot Monitor is going to run that SQL request automatically, continuously, and provide feedback to them regarding the number of SQL connections. All right, and here's how it's done. Everything you see on the screen here, all these lights and bars and so forth, these are active data collection that's taking place. And uh, while a lot of this is built in, you can also be a little bit more creative and use those IBM SQL services as long as they return a single value. So here is that same SQL statement embedded into Robot Monitor, looking at IP version 4 connections at 5,000 and above, because it turns out that there are thresholds. 65,535 connections is the absolute maximum. And if we reach that absolute maximum, we can send out notification. All right, and we can send it out multiple ways. We can also color code what you see on the screen. All right, so we're um, we haven't even reached 500, so we're just going to be color coded in blue. All right, all right, which is right here. So this is where we currently are in my academy system. I'm going to double click on my academy system. Here's where that IP version four connection count was over the past nine hours. All right, I might be more interested in looking at that information from more of a summarization view. Where have we been over the past 12 months? All right, so this is that same statement being executed, and then we average that count by month and by day and by hour. All right, so we can see here for the month of April, we average about 193 connections. If I click on April, it shows me my daily averages. We were a little high here on Thursday. If I click on Thursday, uh, April 18th, now it shows me my hourly averages. And I can even click into that hour, and it's going to show me just the data from that one hour time period here on April 18th. All right. 
And then if you need to, you can even drill down into a particular point in time, like April 18th at 1042, we collected the information about all those jobs that were running using the most CPU, had the worst interactive response time, the highest IO, or the most CPU due to SQL. Now, of course, on this system, we're pretty much doing just uh, <laughs> robot. But for instance, if I wanted to drill into one of these jobs, I could do that and I could work with the individual job and this job is no longer in the system. Of course, I could look at the job log, but if there was an SQL payload, I could even um, look at the SQL statement. All right, and we did that all automatically. So we just wanted to point out that, yeah, you can run these all uh, you know, by yourself one by one, or you could automate it using a tool that's monitoring your entire system and application, and that's called Robot Monitor. And that that gives you more more uh, actually more information because you you have the possibility with all these these services to get uh, this data and you can know the the amount of collections at at a particular point if, in time. But if you add it to robot monitor, you you actually stop getting data and you have information and you can start troubleshooting thing. That that's really cool. Right. Yeah. You can be more proactive with your troubleshooting, right? That's right. Yes. Yeah. All right. Let's look at restricted state and system console and so forth. Okay. So, uh, like we said before, um, you have uh, not only 5250, but you also have all the options that you used to have with 5250. So, if you set up your uh, connection with your HMC console, uh, host name or IP on the console tab, you are able to access the console for each system, the HMC console, using uh, ACS. And basically the steps is um, just filling the data there, then on console going to HMC console, and then you have the normal steps that you have to follow. Select language, enter your username and password, select the uh, helper, and then you get the log on screen for uh, DSP01 at QCT, or however you name your, your console. So that's a really cool thing. And uh, what's even cooler is that you have a virtual control panel. So there you have the IPL mode, the IPL type, uh, you have the data for the system, and you have the DSRCs, uh, the list of the latest SRCs. So that's a really cool tool. Um, Alex, do you suppose yeah. any, anybody listening to this webinar has even ever seen a front panel on a, I, on a power I server? Probably not. I think so. I don't think so, no. no. I, I, I only saw the front panel of a Power 9, and only on a webcam I saw front panels from all our systems, so this is, this is really great. And okay, and the other thing that you can do, you, you can also do with with ACS, it's the open source package management. So basically, what you have with uh, ACS is the ability to uh, enable, if you don't have it enabled, the, the your open source environment. You click there on the open source package management for your uh, for your LPAR, then you enter your user ID and password, and you have the option. Uh, below where it says proxy mode to select known that means that your IBMA has somewhat access to the to the internet but if you if it doesn't you can use your own laptop as an SSH tunnel so your helper will be accessing IBM using using your the access from your uh, laptop so that's really cool you can install stuff on on your helper without having access to the internet so uh, once you open that the open source packet man package management on the first tab you get all the packages that you have installed uh, for instance there I have Coral installed uh, on the middle you get uh, if you have an update available and then on the last tab you have you have uh, all the packages that you can install, but in there, if if we are standing on curl and we hit on information, you have all the information of uh, the curl uh, version that you have installed. The architecture, of course, is PowerPC. Uh, you have the size. You have um, 
the files where, where they are at. So this is a really um, cool way to, to manage your um, open source. So yes, that's the live demo type time for okay, Alex. How about so, just a quick, yeah, a quick demo, quick demo. Okay, yeah, so let's do a quick demo and uh, let's share this. So basically, I have my uh, helper here, so I'm going to go to open source management. And of course, I need to enter my user ID and password. Here, you need to have started your uh, SSH uh, TCP server. So uh, once that you're connected, it will it will bring up the package packages that you have installed. So I have plenty of stuff here. I have Nano. I have uh, Perl, I have Python, of course, I have RPM, so I can RPM, I can do WGETs, I can do YUM, and in the middle I get uh, the updates that are available, and since I'm a really good guy, I don't have updates, I have everything updated, and then I can see the available packages, so I'm going to see, okay, I, I if I want to do some uh, nice stuff, I, I can get uh, Ansible and I can have it installed on my system and it's as easy as clicking on Ansible, clicking on install, it will ask me if I if it's okay to proceed with the install, I will click yes and it will start downloading and installing all the packages and it may take some time because there are like 10 packages, so uh, I'm not sure if we want to see the bars going but okay it completed in time i think nice yep. so it's um it's inst okay it downloaded it's installing so it's it's a really cool way to to manage your software your open source software and this is something that it's been used more and more on your system so yeah yep that's a good that's point fine. alex it is being used open source as we all know is is more and more important on this platform and once again that's why we say that you know uh, we're trying to make our system look n normal and more mean, normal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so anyway, um, just to conclude today's webinar, I just want to point out that we did take a look at one tool in the robot product line called robot monitor for actually embedding SQL services requests and having us do the data collection and monitoring and threshold notification and reporting and so forth of that information. Of course, the uh, complete robot product line is something we're quite proud of and Alex and I work with uh, quite a bit. And basically all the modules are there for you to fully automate your system, including um, automating your application using robot schedule and robot replay and so forth, monitoring, health reporting using performance navigator, report management tools and so forth. And we've been doing m m all of this holistic type IBMI automation, uh, et cetera, for many years here. Uh, we've been in business for more than 40 years now. So whatever your needs are around IBM I, we certainly will be able to help you with some solution or professional service. And with that, Alex, I want to thank you for your time. I really appreciate you joining me for this. And we'll certainly be doing more webinars together in the near future. And I hope everybody out there has a great rest of your day, rest of your week. And uh, thanks for paying attention.